how to time buy and selling in SME stocks. Wow. <laughs> it's an interesting question. I have the same question as well. We have another question from Vishwajit Tranjak. Um, he's shared his portfolio with us. Nuvama, NH, which I'm assuming is Narayan Rudalai, Medanta, Senko, Bajaj Finance, and he has some investments in the US, mainly Tesla and Microsoft, and he's 26 years old. Do you have any advice on what he should do with his portfolio? Why should we get the advice over him? Yeah. <laughs> we can expect a bull market run in the run-up to the elections? Oh, I think that's something that might happen after results. So I think that you know, in the market, we have this sell-on news syndrome. Sell-on news is that people are expecting a particular event, a favorable event. But then you realize that after the event has taken place, the stock prices go into a correction mode. In this case, the event is a greater majority for the BJP. And God forbid if the BJP seat count decreases. So S. Degotan holding 160 of Lin India stock, which he purchased at 6,000 back in September 2023. He says he's in huge losses. So what should he do? Hey guys, welcome to this special 50th final episode of season one of our podcast. We're here with our recurring guest, Mr. Deepan Mehta, to once again answer any questions you might have. So let's get straight into it. Um, we've got a number of questions from a number of our viewers, and uh, there's several things that they want to know from you. So the way we're going to do this is I'm just going to throw a question at you. Do you want to just give me the answer straight up? Absolutely. And first of all, it's been a privilege and pleasure to be on all so many of the shows. And I think season one has gone really very well and we've got a good response. So I'm sure viewers are looking forward to season two as well. Absolutely. So let's get straight into it. So the first question we have from our viewers is what should they do with their portfolio in this current bull market? Should they square off the portfolio and wait for election results to re-enter? No, see, I think that Anybody doing set, uh, creating a portfolio, managing a portfolio is doing it for the long term. And elections, budgets, earning season, geopolitical events will come and go. But that does not mean that you should liquidate your entire portfolio and try and time the market and get into the market again. No. I think strategically you can add cash when you feel the market is topping out and uh, it's run up significantly. And adding cash could mean that you don't invest further. The cash flows which are there, you keep it in your portfolio as cash or you sell off some shares which have not been performing well or try and improve the quality of your portfolio by selling off some of the duds. So it is not a like a black and white that just because an event is coming we should sell off completely. There's just a more of a strategic move that investors can make. And I do feel that considering the market is a bit overheated and we have a major event happening, it's a good advice to just stay a little bit in cash in your portfolio so that when the correction comes, you have that cash which is strategic in nature and you can buy stocks at attractive valuations with margin of safety. Makes sense. So just continuing on this theme actually, because we have another question on this. Um, we're seeing many major geopolitical events happening. How can one be on top of all of these? When how are they affecting the market? <laughs> you need to be got to be on top of all of these things. There are so many things happening in the world. Uh, we live in interesting times. We also live in dangerous times. And, uh, you know, uh, the kind of peace which we had after the Berlin Wall and, you know, the uh, kind of uh, Cold War once it was over, the kind of peace we had, certainly we are seeing that that particular peaceful situation in the world is gradually eroding. And, uh, you know, too many, uh, I would say, dictators have come on the scene and they have their own views and thoughts about geopolitics. So this is something which is going to keep on happening for the next several years, I think. So I think investors have to learn to live with geopolitical events. And end of the day, you can make it work in your favor as well. Because these geopolitical events, unless they are really serious and come at our doorstep, I don't think they really make a material impact on the corporate profits. So from that point of view, I think if the geopolitical event, take advantage of it. But don't get scared of what scared about it, but keep it in mind that it can have a temporary effect on stock prices. Okay. So in a different way, Vibhu Singh 6999 um, wants to know more about practical fundamental analysis. And of course, we've got a whole series uh, on portfolio management and we've got a couple episodes on selecting the right stocks. But is there any advice you can give to Vibhu Singh about how to do fundamental analysis? Oh, that's like several podcasts <laughs> to understand how to do fundamental analysis. But a good place to start would be, you know, there are so many online tutorials. There are books as well. 
and you should give it a shot to understand how fundamental analysis takes place, what is issue analysis, how to analyze the balance sheet, how to study your business, understand its future prospects, risk factors, valuation. I think it's an entire science and art by itself. But if you have the passion, then there are so many online and offline tools available and you should take it up. But in our own series over here, we have been doing a little bit of discussion on fundamental analysis. I remember we did a podcast on checklists for stocks. Right. So that's a good place to start. Okay. So moving on, uh, Deepak Chaudhary, um, I can't read the full handle, but Deepak Chaudhary is asked a specific question. Um, stock available at 20 times trailing 12 months. What that means? Um, presumably, he's referring to the concept of PE. But do you want to expand on that for a minute? So trailing 12 months means basically last 12 months. So today we are in uh, March. And March results are not yet out. So for trading 12 months would be the March quarter of last year and then the three quarters of this financial year. So that's March 23 and June to December 23 as well. So that trading 12 months comes to that. And trailing 12 months is important because that's the historic data which we have. And I personally prefer doing a valuation and my assessment of a stock based on trading 12 months so it is not looking too much into the future. If you're trailing 12-month earnings per share and the derived price to earnings multiple is reasonable, which is about 20 times or so, then you can take a view that the stock is in reasonable territory. But 20 times by itself means nothing. Okay, 20 times may be extremely attractive for a very high growth company and maybe extremely high for a company which is completely stagnating its earnings or it has going into the next 2-3 years where the earnings are actually going to decline. Okay, so... We have a question on how to allocate your portfolio between sectors for conservative, balanced and aggressive profiles. So do you want to share your thoughts? Of course, we can't do a complete sector breakdown. For those that want to see our sector breakdown, then they can look at the last video where we compiled that. But any thoughts on how you should change your portfolio allocation for conservative, balanced and aggressive? So I have a different way of looking at it. And that is, I think, it's a personal choice. And what is your risk appetite? And you should test that. I think if the market falls by 10% and you are shaken up and you lose sleep over the fact that your portfolio was corrected by 15% or so, then for you, conservative stocks, which is large cap stocks, or mutual funds which focus on large cap equities, that is the choice for you. If you have that of the view that you don't mind taking a 15-20% knock in your portfolio as well. And uh, you know you have other assets or regular income to kind of back you up. Then certainly you should have an aggressive portfolio of small mid-cap stocks. And these are the two extremes and moderation lies somewhere in between. So I think it's a very, very personal choice. It's not dependent at all upon the age or the career of the person. But it's more dependent upon your temperament. And more importantly, I think, how managing your portfolio is going to affect your lifestyle. For example, if you have steady income in form of salary or business, then you can certainly have an aggressive portfolio because you have that steady inflow to take care of uh, your day-to-day expenses and future commitments which you may have. But if you're relying on your portfolio for day-to-day expense or for immediate large expenses may come through, then automatically you need to be a bit conservative. So that's one part. Another way to look at it also is that in bear markets, common sense is you should have an aggressive portfolio. In bull markets, it built out conservative portfolio because, you know, uh, markets are volatile and you need to be counter, your strategy has to be to be able to counter those volatilities. But I want to just underline something that, that you mentioned that I think is is different than the question asked or pointed out. So, you don't see conservative balance or aggressive portfolios as different sector allocation, but rather different market cap allocations. That's right. In the the same sector, you could have companies which are more volatile and smaller companies which can grow faster. And the same sector, we have companies which are pretty much stable businesses. But yes, there there are some sectors which are more aggressive because they are valued also accordingly. And, you know, prime example is these internet companies. We had an episode on that as well these high growth internet companies, if you're investing in them, then you're taking an aggressive stance. But if you're investing in FMCG companies, then your stance is more conservative. And sometimes, uh, you know, size of the company also matters. 
like within the software industry, classic example, TCS, Infosys, HCL Tech are conservative companies with less earnings volatility and uh, you know more predictable earnings with smaller companies, Tata Alexi, Persistent Systems, KPIT, CoForge. Their earnings do tend to fluctuate a lot. So even within the industry, you can have disparity in earnings. Got it. So Caesar Cypher wants to know more about agrochemicals and specialty chemicals. So, I mean, we're not really doing a sector podcast anymore, but you want to give us a couple of minutes on agrochemicals and specialty chemicals? It's a complicated sector for one. And unless you have deep domain knowledge about the products over there, I wouldn't want to dabble in them. And there was a time when specialty chemicals were available at extremely attractive valuations. They were like, value below at or at around other commodity stocks but since then you know this entire china plus one strategy and then there's been a huge up move in a lot of specialty chemical product prices and that led to explosive earnings for a lot of specialty chemical companies and uh, i think about four or five years from well four or five years ago the street discovered that and we've been seeing a massive uh, wealth creation but then last couple of years have been a very tepid, last one year has been very tepid for specialty chemical. So as I said, it's a very complicated uh, uh, industry. You cannot paint all the companies with a single brush. Agrochemicals in particular moves along with the way agriculture and monsoon flows. So from that point of view, I think um, from a retail investor's perspective, I would tend to avoid it. Leave it for a professional, I would say. Got it. So Simranjit Singh has a specific question on footwear. So, you know, we did a sectoral podcast on footwear communities. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. So, Simranjit is asking about the unorganized Chinese or copy product markets, which is in huge demand for low-income youth groups. Do you think that's a significant challenge to these companies? Absolutely. I think uh, it's a challenge and an opportunity. The reason we are so positive on retail companies and also positive on footwear companies like, say, Campus Activewear or Metro Brands because they are steadily building their brand and they will gain market share at the expense of the unorganized players, including the Chinese imports which are coming through the unorganized players. And how do you do that? I think you do that by creating a connect with the customer, by having physical presence as well as online presence, by producing products which are superior in design and quality, and by creating an aspirational, you know, kind of a desire around your products. So that's what these companies have been doing uh, very successfully and they will go on that path and journey. And eventually we will have more and more organized retail players in the footwear industry. So in times when the economy is under stress, the unorganized players will do well. But when spending starts to kick in, is the organized players with brands which will start to do well. So it's a threat and an opportunity. Understood. So Saya and Guva who's actually been a long-time viewer of ours, has asked for some analysis on the alcohol and alcohol sector. In fact, Sayan, we're sorry we can't make the full episode, but could you give us some thoughts on the alcohol and alcohol sector? One line to summarize it is that it has lived below its potential. And the reason for that is not to do with the company, it's to do with state policies. So alcohol beverages are heavily regulated by state governments for price increases and for distribution as well. And because of that, they're not able to get to their full, uh, I would say, potential. And from time to time, there are restrictions on consumption, there are restrictions on pricing, uh, and that prevents a full growth rate for these companies, although the demographics really favor Alcobev companies. Uh, so from that point of view, uh, you know, it's a bit of a handicap and an opportunity. But also valuations are very expensive for Alcobev companies. So you need to be a bit selective. These are great companies to buy when there's a correction in the market. And the last thing I would like to add is that the regional players who are able to manage the regulations far better than the large cap MNCs are, I think, better positioned. And, you know, if they come at attractive valuations, you could consider them. Okay. I hope that helps you, Sian. Um, So Hostel Life has a request for you. He wants a small case for investors. So I know that's something you worked on previously. Is that something you want to share with our viewers? No, sure. I think, you know, we look, could, could look at small case per se. But, uh, you know, the best way to start is to start building your own portfolio, analyze it, 
and uh, try and see what stocks are uh, worth investing in on your own. Other than that, there are always the mutual funds are there. So I don't believe in a, a kind of a middle product like small case. Either you go with the mutual funds or you or a, or a portfolio manager or you do it yourself. I think why have something in between? Makes sense. So, Sosti Pat wants to know more about reset invests. Okay, so this is a great question. And uh, REITs and invests are going to be the product of the future. So right now, no investors are too focused on equity. But a time will come when equity markets will tend to be pretty, you know, bearish or I would say flattish and may not give the desired returns. At that point of time, a lot of money will go into income funds. And REITs like real estate investment trusts and other, uh, I would say, infrastructure investment trusts are great products when it comes to investing in form of debt. Because what they do is they have an underlying asset which has got steady, predictable cash flows and they bundle that into a trust or like a mutual fund and then they are giving you the direct pass-through in, in those incomes over there. There are certain tax benefits as well. So I think uh, more and more going forward, these investment trusts are going to get a popularity with investors. Especially when there's a correction in stock prices and investors want the safety of predictable incomes. So I think they're a great product and they have a fantastic future. From India's perspective, we need more infrastructure and real estate investment trusts. So when we can invest more in those industries at the uh, by using the resources of the common retail investor and not necessarily institutional money. It makes sense. So Abhichi Devnath, wants to know what your best large cap ideas are over the next couple of months and years because as we've discussed previously we think that the next cycle these next couple of years is going to belong to large caps yeah you're right Varun. i think that when markets have run up the way they have and valuation the way they are for small mid cap companies definitely large caps are a good place to be overweight in Go for the index stocks. I think the large index stocks should do pretty well. Reliance Industry, Larsen and Tobro. And of course, banks are our favorite HDFC, ICICI Bank. So if you make a basket of 15, 20 large cap stocks, you should be pretty fine, pretty, your portfolio should do pretty well with the next one or two years or so. I don't have any specific preference for any large cap uh, you know, stock per se. And you could certainly look at buying, uh, you know, a mutual fund, which is like a exchange traded fund mm -hmm. on a Nifty or a BVSC Sensex. That also will do pretty well. Mm -hmm. But uh, by and large, I think uh, one should be overweight in large cap stocks at this point of time. Makes sense. So J.D. Trivedi uh, has an interesting question, which I'm not sure he want to answer, but he wants to know how to time buy and selling in SME stocks. Oh, wow. <laughs> It's quite an interesting question. I have the same question as well. How to buy and sell SME stock? Well, frankly, you know, we are not looking at SME stocks at all. Because it's just too high risk, too high return. And that's not something which fits at least our philosophy. So from that point of view, we don't have any coverage on any SME stocks. And I wouldn't want to, you know, give a real answer to when is the right time to buy or sell. All I can say is that um, you know, these companies are really small. And there's a lot of speculative activity also in them. Uh, so, you know, be extremely cautious when you're looking at SME stocks and especially companies where valuations have gone berserk. Those need to be completely avoided. So I would say that unless you are a market player and you have a certain edge in a particular company or industry, do not dabble in SME stocks. Okay. Makes sense. So Singram Singram has a question once again pertaining to the elections. And he wants to know whether we can expect a bull market run in the run-up to the elections. Oh, I think that's something that might happen after results. Seems like he's completely discounted the idea that there may not be a bull market in either case. But yeah, well, I think that you know, in the market, we have this sell-on news syndrome. So let me explain what is sell-on news syndrome. Sell-on news is that people are expecting a particular event, a favorable event. And that event actually takes place. But then you realize that after the event has taken place, the stock prices go into a correction mode. The reason for that is that people have bought an expectation of those event, of that favorable event, or they are not sold waiting for the markets to go up after that event takes place. 
in this case the event is a greater majority for the bjp so in my opinion uh, bjp may come with a higher majority all right but that has got discounted and you may experience a sell on new syndrome when it actually happens and god forbid if the bjp seat count decreases then that can certainly impact the sentiment but i just want to add over here a very important aspect that whether the nda comes with a simple majority or a thumping majority there's a great deal of uh, continuity in government policies and uh, all such correction because of adverse political development could be good entry point because the earnings momentum is not going to get vitiated by 15 20 seats coming less for nd or more so vishwajit tranjan um has asked a question how can we select companies at early stages what parameters do you look for for example in the paisa makers stocks series how do you find these companies so first of all i think again checklist so one of the critical points of early finding early stage companies is your checklist you could have size of market capitalization so if you feel that the market cap of the company should be less than 2000 crores that's how you find early stage companies and that coupled with the opportunity will tell you whether it is a early stage business or not because you could have a small cap company but the size of the industry or the size of the opportunity may be small in that case it's not a early stage company but if it's a market cap company which is low pursuing an opportunity or industry which is huge then i would call that company to be in the early stage also the length of the uh, existence of the company the age of the promoters uh, what uh, exact uh, you know business model of the company these are all factors which determine whether it is a early stage company or it is a more mature business so we have another question from bishwaji tranjan um he shared his portfolio with us nuvama and h chamal simi is narayan judalai medanta senko bajaj finance arman financial services punawala fincorp and mas financial services and he has some investments in the us mini tesla and microsoft and he's 26 years old do you have any advice on what he should do with his portfolio well, i should be taking advice from him yeah. <laughs> uh, because except for arman finance i uh, i i completely agree with his stock pick only uh, suggestion i have for him is that it's too much focused on financials please add some more technology stocks add some more capital goods companies you could look at larsen and tobro uh, you know we've covered even another company called vietec webag in our paisa maker stock um, there is itd cementation also uh, these are companies we have a positive view on but at corrections and i repeat at corrections if these stocks are corrected by 15 20 25% or so those are good entry points so you should have a balanced portfolio and what is missing is uh i software what is missing is capital goods what is missing is pharmaceutical companies and the larger names over there to certainly suffice but other than that the quality of the portfolio is pretty fine nice so jayadeep trivedi has once again asked us a question he wants to know our opinion on ratan india enterprises that i will pass for and i don't have any idea about ratan india enterprises so uh, but uh, i know the stock has done well and it's created a lot of wealth it's an aggressive management if you are sitting on profit remain invested saurabh linga is asking much share india securities who oh, yes they are also a quality player in the stock market they have a slightly different business model they are focused more on trading and uh, they have a certain edge when it comes to technology and risk management and also uh, nurturing good quality traders this company will do always very well when volumes are on the higher side and there's volatility which has been the case so far so i would say that considering that uh, you know we are in the the market which is a bull zone and volumes are looking up you could remain invested in share india okay sachin purohit wants to know about jupiter lifeline hospitals again i think it's a new listing so i'm not completely familiar with the company but generally we are very positive on healthcare companies and you know spending on healthcare is a secular uh, uh, kind of spend it's going to increase gradually year after year uh, but so i think that if he's got at a good price and he's sitting on profit then he could certainly remain invested in jupiter life sciences uh, these companies which are home grown which have done i'm sure it has done very well uh, have got very aggressive managements 
and have got certain USPs which you know enable them to grow the business. So positive one that particular stock per se. Why did uh, you know uh, he's got the right price? Okay. So Shivar Shrikant Kotap Kotap Party is asking about Himant Singh side, Gokul Das Exports and SP Apparel. Okay, so these are all export-oriented companies. My favorite over here is Google Das Exports, and that stock, mind you, has corrected also recently. A disclosure that you know we are looking at this company quite closely, uh, and it has done some interesting acquisition in the Middle East, uh, which will enable it to grow the earnings pretty well over the next few years or so. It's a large-sized garment player, apparel player, and uh, it supplies to some of the marquee names. So I'm more inclined towards that as compared to some of the other names over there. Chitra Chitra Gupta has asked a really interesting question. Um, they bought G1 more than five years ago at 58 rupees. And the debt to equity is 7.08. Obviously, it's a bank, so debt to equity is higher, much higher. They want to know whether they should hold or sell. Look, G1 Small Finance Bank and G1 Finance were one of our PESA maker stocks, and I'm very positive on that company disclosure. We and our clients are invested. So from that point of view, my advice will be to remain invested. Last quarter, they have come out with impressive set of uh, numbers for the, uh, for the March quarter in terms of deposit growth and advanced growth. And certainly, they have fused up their collection efficiency. So very positive on the company. Uh, you can buy Ujjivan Small Finance Bank through Ujjivan Financial Services. There is a small but nice arbitrage available if you do that. So, do you want to talk about the debt to equity for a second? Because that's something that Chitra has flagged as a concern. Uh, just to explain why that's different for banks. See, basically, it's an NBFC uh, turned into a bank. Okay. From that point of view, with the lending business, you know, having a debt to equity ratio of up to 10 times is not so bad because, at the end of the day, that's your business model. And whatever money you have taken on loan, it's a you have in turn lent to somebody else. It is all productive use of capital. And RBI has got very strong norm about capital adequacy, which Ujjivan Small Finance Bank is certainly following. And they are well within the capital adequacy ratio, which is required by RBI for NBFC. So I wouldn't be too concerned about the debt to equity ratio for this company. Okay. So Vajit Parker is asking a question on IDBI Bank. Um, so Vajit is asking a question about what to be expected by May 2024. But maybe we can give a slightly longer term view as well. So I think maybe he's really looking at IDBI Bank because it's a privatization candidate. And after the election, I think it will be the first of the block to come when it comes to privatization. It's just got a bit delayed. Uh, but more interestingly, IDBI Bank has cleaned up its entire book. And now it's a nice high performer bank. If I was in this place, I would remain invested. Kapara G. Patel wants to know your view on Kembond Chemicals. Oh, I'll take a pass on that. One. It's a very small company and I don't really have coverage on that. So Deepak K. Chaudhary has a question on 361. Uh, specifically, the cash on operating activities is negative. Can you expand on why that may be the case and you know how investors should view that? First of all, uh, 361 was one of our PESA maker stocks. So disclosure, that we like the company per se and we are invested in it. Uh, and we like the wealth management business a lot because that's, you know, India's uh, kind of growth is generating a lot of wealth and managing the wealth is a good business to be in. I'm not so certain that their cash flows are negative. In fact, it's asset light business and their operating cash will be positive. So I'm not certain how that question is. So what we'll do is we we'll try and get some info and we'll pop that in the comment as well. Jagwohan Belwal wants to know about the valuations of Kaplan Point. Again, another PESA maker stock of ours. Should we wait for it to cool off or is now the right time to enter? See, I think uh, overall the market seems to be, um, you know, yeah, we are cautious on the market. So from that point of view, we would advocate that unless you have too much of cash in your portfolio, you should just postpone your purchases. Like if you have 30-40% cash in your portfolio, then by all means, Kaplan points, but other PESA maker stocks, you could consider them. Not recommendation, but certainly do your study and consider them. But if your world is fully invested, then don't add more money, even if it's a good quality stock like Kaplan point. And, um, you know, valuation wise, going about 30, 35 times or so. It's not very expensive per se. Uh, and it's not a good uh, growth business and it's present in a niche geography, which is what appeals to us. Basically, it gets large revenues from 
Latin America, uh, where it has established an entire network and the brands and it has a way of collection also in place. So it's a very interesting business model from that point of view. Okay. Kamlesh Jain wants to know about Kaya Limited. Kaya Limited was quite a hot favorite of the market, but somehow it has just been off the radar for many investors and been off the news as well. And largely because it has not performed to its true potential. The story behind Kaya is very interesting. They set up, uh, you know, these kind of clinics or centers where one can go and get skin treatment, hair treatment. But when you look at the actual numbers which come through, and mind you, it was backed by Mariko, so they have the management bandwidth and the quality. But when actually numbers come through, it certainly hasn't, uh, you know, performed up to expectations. And I don't really know the reason why. Uh, but it has just, you know, been a stagnant performer, which is why it has dropped off the radar for many investors, including us. So, S. Degotan has an interesting question. He's been holding 150 of Lin India stock, which he purchased at 6,000 back in September 2023. I don't know where Lin India is currently, but he says he's in huge losses. So, what should he do? Book his loss and exit or, rem or remain invested? But I think it will have been invested and that was slightly longer term view. Lind India is a quality player and some of the products it manufactures it has got great pricing power over there. And India is in the process of setting up huge semiconductor capacity. And semiconductor requires gases which are produced by Lind India or can produce those gases. So a huge opportunity will open up for Lind India once we start getting semiconductor capacity in play. So I'm not negative on the stock in there. This is typically what happens only if I can just extend uh, this concept to the viewers that it is not enough to buy a good quality business at any price. You need to get the right good quality business at a reasonable price and that's the secret to superior returns. Uh, so if he's bought Lind India, which is a good quality business with great growth momentum, with a very expensive valuation, then one or two bad quarters or overall correction in the market, or whenever there's institutional selling, what the adverse news, you'll see the stock price correct, uh, you know, at a higher proportion. So it's not just good enough to identify right business, but buy it at reasonable valuation. And that's why I think this investor has made a mistake. All right. So I think uh, I'll go to the next question from Arnal Ghosh, who may have made a similar mistake with Credit Access Grameen. He bought Credit Access Grameen at 1,640 rupees. And as of the point of this comment, it was... 1,350. I think it's moved from there. But could you elaborate on what he should do here? Should he hold or exit? Well, I think you should remain invested. It's one of India's largest um, uh, microfinance company. Has done exceptionally well. They're very focused on risk management and collection efficiency. And most importantly, their geographical base is pretty well diversified. So we're very positive on credit access. And he could remain invested. I think certainly the stock price uh, will cover lost ground pretty much. Okay. So, Abhijit K. Rao wants us to review SGS Sirma, uh, which may be a typo, but SGS, no, it's, it's SGS, SGS Sirma. So, SGS Sirma is a new listing and it's done exceptionally well post-listing. It is in this very interesting space called uh, electric Electronic Manufacturing Services, which is EMS. Uh, so what they do is that, uh, you know, somebody who doesn't, who, who has a product design, an electronic product design, and doesn't want to actually manufacture it, you will outsource that to a company like Sirmia SGS and, uh, you know, have a long-term manufacturing contract with them. And Sirmia will use its own technology and resources to keep the cost of production low. Uh, customers of that such companies are, are extremely sticky because once you have a manufacturing relationship, it's difficult to, find another supplier for you and this entire trend towards companies focusing just on design and outsourcing the manufacturing that's something that companies are borrowing a page from Apple because that's what exactly Apple did and uh, more and more consumer oriented businesses industrial companies are looking at good quality EMS players like Sermia SGS so I think it's a great future another example of a very good company but valuations are on the high side so I would avoid it from just the point of view that it's expensive valuations and if you buy it at these levels, you may not get the best returns. So thinking, sticking on this theme of EMS, Singram Singram has asked a question on EMS as well. 
where he wants to know why are Scient, DLM, and Craftsman Automation so silent in terms of return? No, I first of all, Craftsman Auto is an auto ancillary company. It's not an EMS player. Uh, Scient, Scient DLM is an EMS player, and they've done exceptionally well. Again, a good quality company. They have got aerospace clients as well. But valuation, you know, Varun, we come back to that all the time. You know, there are so many interesting businesses in India. It's not. Funny, there are so many nice budding companies, aggressive managements, uh, good growth prospects, can grow at 30-40% also. But the valuation 70, 80, 90, 100 times and the market top like this, I'm not certain that I want to look at them uh, you know, in terms of uh, investing at these levels. At least, but they're on my radar as they should be on all investors. At correction, you find them at reasonable valuations. Those are good entry points. Finally, we've come to our last question of the day. Um, Bada Paisa wants to know about some key concepts. TB, ROE, leverage, cost of capital. And uh, he wants to know about all this in context of five-star, five-star finance. So could you maybe expand on what these concepts are and apply them to five-star? So Five Star Business is uh, another quality NBFC and it focuses on uh, lending to the mid-income and more importantly, it focuses on areas which are tier 2, tier 3 and they get the talent pool from there itself. Now, ROI for that business also is in the highest at ROI return on investment. So all the return ratios for a company like Five Star, which is focused more on retail lending, small ticket loan, is on the higher side. The return on asset is also, I am doing other numbers off the cuff. But certainly they would be in the mid-teens or so about and superior to some of the other quality players and other quality players in the NBFC space. And because the growth prospects are very good and is growing at I think 15 to 25% thereabout, these ratios can only improve going forward or so. So from that point of view, we are positive on this company. Uh, but uh, as I said, you know, uh, I don't think Five Star has really seen a huge meltdown in the NBFC space and I think it needs to be tested better. So that's one risk factor we need to highlight. So Bara Paisa's question is very much related to the level of leverage that this company is taking. Now I don't have the number on uh, debt to equity or any any ratios but do you have any comments on the leverage? It's an NBFC company pretty well managed their capital adequacy ratios are well in control and I wouldn't worry too much about the debt level. See, NBFCs and banks have to be analyzed very differently. You have to look at their net interest margins. You have to look at their gross NPA and net NPA. You have to look at uh, the distribution of their loan book. And you have to look at how they have raised their resources. And so long as the raising of resources and lending is not concentrated, you are pretty much fine. And most important is the collection efficiency. One thing I'd like to mention is that banks and NBFCs know their biggest cost comes afterwards. So upfront profits come. Upfront profits are seen. But the problems start to come three, four, five years down the line when the credit cycle turns negative and they will start providing for loans which they are made maybe a few years ago. So that's the real risk factor over here. All right. I think that brings us to the end of all the questions we have for the today. And, uh, you know, it's been a... It's been a year of ups and downs, a lot of effort, a lot of work, but a lot of rewards as well. And uh, I want to thank you for, for going on this journey with me because I don't think we would have been here without your consistent presence on this podcast. As I said in the beginning that it's a privilege and a pleasure and I myself have learned so much in this entire process, uh, in this entire season one. And, uh, you know, uh, I think that we are in a position to add true value to investors in a conservative and stable manner. And uh, we will keep on doing this uh, for our investors and our, and, and our viewers. Well, thank you so much for joining us once again. Uh, this is it. We're calling time on season one. We'll see you for all our new series as well as season two of this podcast. Okay, so there's one director's question. Uh, recently an interview came out of Vijay Kiria sir on Mint. Where he told that he spoke about future and option in uh, life training and where he gave a statement if you are a chain smoker you might die in 30 years but if you are a future and option trader you might die next day so what 
do you think on this trading and future and option mentality like for those people what will you say like investing versus trading what's your answer on that so i have another beautiful quote okay. on that by none other than warren buffett and he calls futures and options weapons of mass destruction so but you know people don't heed the advice of uh, these saints like warren buffett or veterans like uh, uh, you know vijay kedia but the fact of the matter remains that these are complicated products and without everybody's cup of tea you need many many years of experience are you seeing many cycles before you can be a successful option trader otherwise basically you are just doing gambling over here and that will never the odds will never be in your favor okay that's it from my i mean it was a pleasure for me also sitting behind the camera and like listening to you live for one year so yeah it was a great experience thank you so much Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Alex. This podcast is produced by Alexa Equities Private Limited, a semi registered research analyst. Registration number INA 00004787. The information provided in this podcast is for educational and information purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Investment in securities market are subject to market risk. We strongly advise all investors to read all related documents carefully before investing.